on the path for mm-hmm. me on my 21st day in the 86 day journey. Yeah. I had a an experience where I was shot at at point blank range. I literally felt a beam of energy come down through the top of my head, down through the soles of my feet, planting me. And pl- I saw the bullet leave the chamber. Yeah. I saw the light flash. I saw the smoke. And people talk about this where it goes in slow motion. He continued to fire. Self. Our, our ability to work on us is imperative. And I think that this is one of the things that we don't talk enough about, particularly in the context of leadership. Like your inner work should be a prerequisite before you put your hands on power. We wait till it gets dire. Yeah. And, you know, and so much of our societal conditioning teaches us to wait till it gets dire. You know, it's whatever our version of rock bottom is Mm -hmm. before we make the changes that we often know we need to make. Outside looking in, you know, you look, you look great, but you're not feeling it. And I was hiding, quite frankly. Uh, Were you saying that you were hiding from your true self? I think I was hiding from my true self. I was hiding from uh, both being honest about the relationship, you know, Mm -hmm. great guy, but not the one I was hiding in terms of the work doing really good work but not my work I talk a lot about that in the book but um I just was coasting it's about that being willing to question and challenge what we've been told we are in the midst of a great renegotiation Welcome to Driving Impact. Hello, Driving Impact crew. I'm super excited about our next guest. Our next guest is an entrepreneurial soul coach with a 30 plus year career and everything that we call cultural innovator, social impact strategist, and creative change agent. Serendipity brought us together where we met, and for some reason, I really like their energy, I like their vibe, and then I discovered her book, which is called The Calling, and we'll talk about it. Three fundamental shifts to stay true, get paid, and do good. Our guest, Ra Goddess, has coached hundreds of luminaries, some of these, and change makers, some of these who ended up becoming like New York Times bestsellers, as well as Times Top 100, has impacted millions of lives across the world. So I'm excited to welcome you to Raw Goddess. Welcome to Driving Impact. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's my honor and my privilege to be here. When I met you for some reason, somehow, I didn't even know that you published two books. I mean, one is an audible coaching program and one is a book, a physical book that we have here today. And I just felt energized by every single word that you were mm-hmm. saying. Thank you. I want to start at the beginning. Okay. I want to understand what is the origin story of your name, Raw Goddess. Where is it coming from? So uh, in order to embody my name, I went through an 86-day cleansing, fasting, vision quest with an incredible woman by the name of Queen Afua. Um, And it was interesting for me because it was at a point in my life where I knew I needed to shake it up, you know, like... Uh, when you looked at sort of what was happening in my life on paper, everything looked amazing, but I was restless. I could feel that there was more that wanted to happen through me. And I think a lot of people, Kathleen, go through that. You know what I mean? Where like, you know, you all, we're we're in a great job, making great money. We're dating a great person. Yeah. (laughs) You feel like you're making it. You know what I'm saying? And on the outside looking in, you know, you look, you look great. But you're not feeling it. And um, and I was hiding, quite frankly. And uh, I were just... Were you saying that you were hiding from your true self? I think I was hiding from my true self. I was hiding from uh, both being honest about the relationship. You know, mm-hmm. great guy, but not the one. Yeah. Um, you know, I was hiding in terms of the work, doing really good work, but mm-hmm. not my work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I talk a lot about that in the book. But um, I just was, you know, coasting. Um, but there was something in me, you know, it was at a time when I was coming into my thirties, my early thirties. And a lot of people know, you know, we talk about 33 being the Jesus year. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But I just could feel that there was something that wanted to move through me and I was running and sort of hiding from it and avoiding it. And um, and I remembered having this interaction, Queen of Fu, a funny story, Queen of Fu and I had the same vocal coach. Mm. And we were living in Brooklyn at the time and uh, we would pass one another on the stairs because she would be going to her vocal lesson after mine and we would always hug and kiss and I'd known her forever and um, and knew her son because he was very active in the, uh, both of their sons, very active in the creative community. Mm -hmm. And one day I just really knew, like, I just need to work with you. And the beginning of the journey, the name came. And the name, the name Ra Goddess, Ra came, Goddess came to you. It came how, to me. How and it, it when? Just, I was in a meditation. I was in a vision. And the name dropped in. And uh, literally spirit said, this is, this is what you are to be called. And so um, I, I sort of like questioned it and wanted to understand the genesis of the name. Yeah. And in the comedic lineage uh, and language, it's pronounced Ra'at in Perth. And it means light supreme. Bringer of the light. So Ra goddess means light like, supreme. Light supreme, bringer of the light. And then you talked about comedic language. What is that? Yeah, so, so uh, Queen of Fu's work is in the ancient Kemetic tradition. The ancient Kemetic tradition is the Nile Nubian region of Africa. So what we know is Egypt. And what we think about is that the Nile River region. Um, and, you know, the history of the people from that region was that they were herbivores. They were vegetarians. Mm -hmm. They they had a very um, sacred relationship with the land. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about dignity. And it was about, you know, when we think about the the history of sort of coming from a lineage of very regal people, yeah. very royal, very majestic people, mm -hmm. very value-centered. Um, and so uh, for me, doing the work in connection with that lineage felt very aligned with my spirit. Um, and I happen to practice and work in a number of ancient African traditions. And I think that's, you know, part of um, our power, I think, is our ability to tap into all of the layers and aspects of our identity. And, you know, I know we're, we're, we're going to get here, but when, you know, I talk about working with leaders, whatever yeah. their cultural lineage is, I think sometimes there's a lot of temptation to leave that at the door. Yeah, to be able to look good or to fit in some for some people is a corporate world. So I want to go back into Queen Afua. Yeah. How did you go like first who is she and how did you get she to meet her? She is an amazing healer and teacher. And you know, it's interesting in that we're now in a time in the health and wellness world where we understand the value of green. Mm -hmm. You know, and green vegetables, leafy vegetables, right, exactly. This is the conversation of sustainability, you know, uh, clean energy, all mm -hmm. of the things that we now sort of are looking at or thinking that they're part of sort of our modern world and part of our modern evolution. The truth of the matter is, is these date back thousands and thousands of years. These come from cultural lineages from all over the globe where people practiced recycling and people practiced working Composting, with clean water. And yeah. You know what I'm saying? Reusing the, water. Reusing. All of these things are, are really ancient practices, mm -hmm. indigenous to various regions throughout the world. So and you're so, talking about thousands of years ago. You're talking ago. about thousands of years. And so Queen is a green pioneer. You know, and when I say green, I'm talking about your leafy veggies. I'm talking about your green juice. I'm talking about your alkaline lifestyle. And, you know, one of the stories I tell a lot about Queen is, you know, 40 years ago, she was in the hood of the hood, you know, that the tough inner city, you know, Where? giving Where addicts green juice and, you know, and, really? and blessing them and sending them love and, you know, dropping, you know, uh, what she calls breath of springs, which are, which is purified peppermint oil on their tongues and telling them to breathe and, you know, to clean up their respiratory systems. And, yeah. you know, she just was, was magical. Um, and certainly for people who would watch her move through the world, they would have this sort of out-of-body experience because, you know, Queen would be walking down the street in best Eye, Brooklyn, and, you know, and she's got her crown on and she's rocking her white and her folded, you know, African sari. And, um, and we loved her, you know, That's the amazing. women... She, just in her presence and her being, she would call you to another level in yourself. You know, this idea of taking your seat as a queen. And mm -hmm. um, and so for me, you know, we are now going on 30 years that I've had the privilege 
So you of met her being 30 in years ago with this woman. Yeah, I mean probably 35 years ago, 35 but really years like ago. studying and working 30 probably going on like I said 30 years and so uh it was so fitting that she held the foundation. Like I believe my spiritual name was coming. My calling was coming. My purpose was coming. Mm-hmm. I was running from it. <laughs> like a lot just, of people. That is just the truth. Right? I was running from it. Um, you make sure that you're very busy. And spirit cornered me through Queen, you mm. know, in many, many ways. And um, and the interaction that we had in the stairwell of that brownstone, you know, in, um, in that time, it opened the door for me to start to say yes to what wanted to move through me. And so I go into this 36, this 86 day cleansing fast. And, and I just want to pause for a second. Yeah. Did you fast for 86 days? Yeah. And, and a cleansing fast. So it's not okay. like totally no food, but what you're eating is designed to, to cause you to purge. Okay. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of green, a lot of water, a lot of liquids, a lot of cold pressed juices. And what are you purging? Uh, oh, everything, you all. I mean, you know, Queen, when we first sat down, <laughs> I love sort of sharing the story. We first sat down, she's like, we're going to get that birthday cake you ate when you were four. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, that's kind of purging. <laughs> right? Like, we go all the way in because, you know, we don't realize that we carry around. Woo. Okay, here we go, Kathleen. We carry around a lot of things, you all. Mental, spiritual, emotional, physical, toxic, waste. Old energies, old conversations, old, old emotions, stuck trauma, all of that's in here. And um, when we commit to really living a vibrant life, when we commit to really living a sustainable life, mm-hmm. when we commit to living a life that really is aligned with our greatest truth, that stuff's got to go. Yeah. And it means that we create practices, we create regimens, we create new habits that enable us to consistently purge and cleanse and clear our energy so that we can be really present and in our full capacity to be who to you're make meant whatever to, contribution. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever contribution we're here to make, whether that's, you know, with our families, whether that's in our professional worlds and the ways in which we're being called, whether that's in our communities Mm -hmm. and all of the other ways, our spiritual uh, institutions. So in order to be our best, self, our our ability to work on us is imperative. And I think that this is one of the things that we don't talk enough about, particularly in the context of leadership. Like your inner work should be a prerequisite before you put your hands on power. I'm going to tell you something, Ra. I'm in, in the corporate world. I spent most of my career there. I was also an entrepreneur before. But I think what's interesting is that like some of the concepts that we're going to talk about today sometimes goes into more spirituality. And then when you say spirituality, that's when people tend to, to run away and people get scared. But before we go there, I want to go back to you were purging for 86 days, cleansing your whole life, physically, spiritually, your ancestors and yes. also um, any things that you've eaten, your body, your yes. soul, etc., your beliefs. I want to talk about your, where did you do that purge? And then what came out of these 86 days? And I want to understand also, were you in isolation or? Yeah. So, so I wasn't fully in isolation. Um, but I will tell you that the more that I went deeper into that process, the more I craved mm. being by myself. I mm. craved being still I crave being quiet and I learned the power of quiet which is something that I talk about and teach about all the time you know Mm -hmm. often people ask me well how do you find your purpose or how do you find your calling or how do you make these big life decisions that often we're faced with every day Mm -hmm. you gotta have yet you gotta have the uh ability to get still Mm -hmm. you have the ability to get quiet you have the ability to learn how to listen to your inner wisdom, your higher wisdom, whether we call that God, whether we call that the universe, whether we call that source or creation or or love, whatever we want to call it, that part of us that really speaks to the core of who we are and speaks to the core of what it is that we're here to do and has our highest interests at heart. To your own interests, not any corporation you work for. Right. Or your family or your partner. But what is good for your spirit? What is aligned with your soul? What is aligned with 
who you are, who you really are, mm -hmm. beyond all the labels and the accolades and the roles and the accomplishments and what it is that you're here to do, what it is that you're here to bring. Now, we bring what we bring through all kinds of vehicles. So mm -hmm. many of the leaders we work with are in corporations yeah. doing phenomenal work, right? As well as many entrepreneurs who are at the front lines of movements for social impact and social change, right? Or who are building fabulous businesses that are transforming the lives of people every day through their products and services. So the vehicles and the conduits through which we serve are of multitude. Mm -hmm. But the truth the way we show up in those vehicles, what we carry, what we offer, what we bring, that requires space to get clear on. And that's that, why you're talking about, like, you have to be still. And when you still. talk about being still and quiet, you mean it's the opposite of being busy. Yes. Because everybody's busy, everybody's running right and left. So yeah. you went into that 86 days. I went cleanse, into that. Yeah. And how did you come out of it? I came out of it so clear. <clears throat> about my life and and you know when we talk about sort of pivotal moments that put you on the path for mm -hmm. me on my 21st day in the 86 day journey yeah i had a an experience where i was shot at at point blank range i was living in bedsty brooklyn at the time i was coming home uh in the late evening uh, that happened in real life. That happened Not, in real man, life. Okay. No, no, no. In so you real life. you're coming. You're coming from your workshop. Coming from. I was coming from work. Okay. I was at a client, um, and at the time I was doing doing consulting work, and uh, I was coming home, and I you know kind of had my little data, as you all know, is 1998. I had my Walkman on. I was listening to my the tunes, Walkman. and I had just stopped by the health food store, and you know I was going to have some miso soup. Like I had a whole kind of plan, and. Um, and I lived in a community in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, where many of us were either the children or the grandchildren of the original residents. So it was a real community vibe. People looked out for one another. We knew, People knew each who other. our neighbors were. Absolutely. And so this guy pulls up on the bike and he asks me, like, where's the Johnsons? And I'm kind of going, Johnsons? I'm looking up sort of in my mental Rolodex, like, I don't know. And then when I look down, he's pointing a gun. What did he want? My purse. He wanted to rob me. Okay, so it was a question to be able to get your, your yeah. purse. What did you do at that moment? To catch me off guard. Um, and so, you know, he said, basically, come here. And I literally felt a beam of energy come down through the top of my head, down through the soles of my feet, planting me in place. And I literally felt almost like a shield come down. I'm feeling, I'm, like, I'm getting chills when you're telling that story. Something absolutely embodied me, an energy and a spirit embodied me. And I looked at him and I said, brother, I don't have anything for you. Wow. And so you said, didn't follow his orders because he wanted you to come here next to him. And he wanted your purse. And then you, you stayed still. I stayed still. And, and, and I really want to say this, had no choice. Like whatever it was that took over my physical being would not allow me to move Ooh. towards him. And he said, you know, I said, come here. And I and literally opened my mouth again to say, brother, I don't have anything for. And I couldn't even get the second time out of my mouth before he fired. So he shot you? Shot. Where? I saw the bullet leave the chamber. Yeah. I saw the light flash. I saw the smoke. And, and literally, and people talk about this where it goes in slow motion. Yeah. Truly everything slowed down. I saw the bullet leave the chamber, but I, to this day, cannot tell you where the bullet went. And, you know, he continued to fire until the gun jammed. But he and I both are like looking down at me and looking up at one another because we both know what was happening. How far were you from him? Probably about 10 feet. 10 feet and then he was shooting at gunpoint and it didn't hit you? Point blank range. That's incredible. And so... And nobody found the bullets nobody anywhere? Nobody found the bullets. And, and, you know, what I say to this day is, I don't know where the bullets went, but the message was not lost on me. The Jeez. message was not lost on me. I just can't, me. I can't believe right? it. It's like, where, was it a real gun? Did it have real bullets? It was bullets? a real gun. <laughs> Everything about that gun looked real to me. Everything okay. about that experience felt real to me. And, and it was interesting because he, you know, he finally gave up and jumped on his bike and kind of threw a threat over his shoulder and, and pedaled down the street. And I stood there and literally after a few moments, I felt that shield, that energy move up 
and then up and out of my body. And of course, that's when I freaked out and went crazy. And like, and what's <laughs> going on? Did, did this really happen? What's you know? And it was a white light that you said, like a protective shield. It was shield. like it was energetically, it felt like light, but it was just a shield that came down and a and a sort of a a rod of energy is the way I would describe it that bolted me in place. The messages yeah. began coming after that. Right now, the messages truthfully had been coming beforehand. Right, mm -hmm. like. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. Anybody recognize that? Yo, you're not supposed to be at that job. Anybody recognize that? This relationship is not the relationship for you. We hear these things. That's a, that's a, these are a lot of downloads, on, right? right? There's a lot this of truth. Is like the voice of wisdom speaks to every single one of us all of the time. But we just shut it down. It's a There you go. We shut it down because there we have go. good reasons not to do it. Before we go there, so the guy who shut you, mm. what was his reaction? He was as shocked as I was. I mean, like I said, we both knew what what was going yeah. on. Did he say anything? He just was like, he just kept firing. Like he was just very committed. Like firing you just very first. committed to achieving his outcome. Yeah. And at some point he got frustrated because, you know, the gun jammed and he's banging the gun and he's still trying to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Um And then at some point he jumps on the bike, frustrated and angry, and he he ran away. Off. But but he was shocked yeah. because again, both of you were shocked. Absolutely. So this is this is major, right? I'm still having chills, and um, so we understand where you're coming from. We understand that that was a chrysalis moment. That's a moment of transformation. No question. It's kind of like the world or the spirit is trying to tell you, like or your intuition, however you want to call it, it's telling you that you're not on the right path. I will protect you with, from whatever path. Yeah. And then, but I want you to have this awakening. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's for me, when I share this story, it's important in the sense of sometimes Kathleen, you know, we have this belief that spirit is soft and it's yeah. woo woo. And it's, you know, it's wussy stuff. Yeah. And, you know, and I feel all the time that the universe is gangster. Mm. And I think the messages come to us In lots of different ways. I, you know, I say we get a light tap on the shoulder. And we get a little bit of a shut up. <laughs> you know what I mean. And then and, you get a shake up. And then you get a shake quake. up and then you get a kick in the you know what. Yeah. And I think um, part of why I believe I'm here mm -hmm. is to help people move before it gets that bad. Right, yeah, because before when it, it is gets life back, threatening yeah, illness yeah, before it, yeah. you know what it, it is the divorce before it is the children who don't speak to you anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, or you you lose a job or you get fired or we wait till it gets dire. Yeah, and you know, and so much of our societal conditioning teaches us to wait till it gets dire. You know, it's whatever our version of rock bottom is mm -hmm. before we make the changes that we often know we need to make. And also because human beings are wired to 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 the status quo, yeah. right? Because it feels comfortable, Safe. right? And then you, if you venture out of it, there's more fear of losing something than gaining something. 100%. So most of us just stay where we are. We keep doing what we're doing. And and the unfortunate thing about that is for many of us, the comfort zone is painful. So we have learned to adapt to the pain or we've learned to adapt to the disillusionment or the apathy, or the disappointment, or the res resignation. And that's where we're living. Mm -hmm. And the truth be told is, we're not really living. We're just existing. And we're living somebody else's life, or even any social construct that we believe is where we should be. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure to conform to those constructs. So that any time, and, and this was my issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't that spirit hadn't been talking to me before the gunshot. Spirit, spirit was all up in my business. And I was like, thank you for sharing. <laughs> but I'm going like to do you're this you're calling me, here. but I'm just going right. to turn up. Right. I'm going to hang but up on you, buddy. Right. I don't understand what you're talking about, right? You know, all of this soul work and all of this moving people to liberate. I'm like, I don't know what that is, God. I'm a consultant. People pay me <laughs> checks, you know, in my name to do that over there. So until you sort all of that out and it can help that make sense for me, I'm over here, you know, and coming out of that experience. And I do want to say, you know, I guess again, shout out to queen. I feel like I was being readied. So in other words, that 21 day fast, that cleansing, that high vibration energy, that call to be in or begin to find what is real alignment with my own sacred truth mm -hmm. I think was part of what enabled me to 
survive that experience. Yeah, to find your your purpose. And I want to make sure because I read your book with a lot of of fashion. It's like I bookmarked. I'm gonna grab it here. I bookmarked a lot of pages because this is like pure gold. It's Thank incredible. Uh, I didn't know what it was up for, but I feel like it. It was a I don't know a spiritual like awakening for me even reading this book and and for our audience I'm going to name the book it's the calling three fundamental shifts to stay through get paid and do good and I feel like we're in the staying through because Ra you were going through a corporate path where we had a good relationship you felt very comfortable and then life forced you to face the music and yeah. to to go into some somewhere else in your book you talk about the story of your father Like, can you tell us more? Like, we thank you for sharing your own story. What is the story of your father, yeah. and how did that impact you? I mean, my father was everything to me. You know, born in the 1920s, he and my mother survived two decades of Jim Crow segregation in this country, which is hard. Which is hard, right? To raise four rambunctious children, I being the youngest. Wow. So I often, you know, sort of describe myself as a change of life baby born into the intersection of civil rights and hip hop, which is kind of the era within which they raised me. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a hardworking man. And he was really passionate about the founding principles of this nation, which is interesting because as a black man, mm -hmm. you know, our relationship, and I, and, and I will say as black people, often our relationship with Uh, the United States of America is tenuous at best. Yeah, it's very, you know, yeah. and, and we can look at many global regions where we have a history of chattel slavery or we have a history of some form of indentured servitude where we have come from a place of not being seen as equal or not being respected uh, to having to really sort of fight for that equality. The relationship to this is, day, to this to day, this day, the relationship is happening. tenuous, yes. right? But my father believed in the founding principles, And it was sort of regardless of the fact of who was at the table that the document, the articulation of the vision mm -hmm. was real. This idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he wanted it. So he believed in the fundamentals of the, this country, the United States of America. And then he was growing up or like trying yes. to figure it out in the Jim Crow era, which was plagued with a lot of civil rights movements, right. challenges for right. equality and, and fights. Right. And it was part of his greatest heartbreak. Yeah. Because he would read this inspiring doctrine, but his reality, his day-to-day -day existence did not mirror that. It was the opposite of right? that. Right, exactly. He didn't have any was civil rights. The, the exact opposite of that. And so he grappled, very much grappled. And so... Again, sort of being a lover, my father was an avid reader. He was a historian. He was an attorney, a litigator. Mm -hmm. um, he worked for uh, legal aid for $12 a day in the 1970s, you know, trying cases for people who just couldn't afford, you know, good legal uh, support or advice and counsel. Um, and our home would be filled with his clients. People you who know, were struggling and needed to be and the a voice. Yeah. They, who needed fair representation. Needed fair representation. And here you are, the youngest of four, to helping people break through and, and finding their calling. So, which I think is his unfinished business. Mm. You know, I, I think about that, that phrase in the Bible, I am about my father's business. And so for me, the dedication in the book is that I feel that I'm here to carry the lineage of what was at the core of what he was doing. So, no, I'm not an attorney, but my work is rooted in liberation. My work is rooted in uh, in equality. My work mm -hmm. is rooted in self-love and, and racial self justice as well. And yes, and justice and equity. And so, um, and, and I want to say, because I think, Kathleen, so much of what even we're grappling with right now on the front lines of what we know to be diversity, equity, and inclusion is a small fraction of what I think the true vision is, which is really that all people get to be their best, mm -hmm. that all people get to thrive, and that this is not a zero-sum game, yeah? Context. That some people are going to win, some people are going to lose. You understand, yeah. right? And I think at a fundamental level, because of so much of old paradigm power, has ingrained in us this belief that there is not enough, we are forced to make choices that I think contradict the nature of our souls. And we can give some examples of that, right? So let's say there's 400 years of slavery 
and then you're the last generation like i'm the most recent generation then my son and then i could go and do a lot of millions of things but like you have you talked about the lineage that we want to be able to be the one for example for me i'm the highest earner in my family i'm the one the first to graduate from master's degree and i left canada to be in the us and now i worked at google linkedin deloitte yahoo and just name all the companies yeah. in corporate and and if like somebody like me and there's there's millions of people like me and you're like oh do i do and go do something super random or i keep doing what i'm doing mm -hmm. and that and the choices and the paradigm yes. is like after 400 years of slavery my parents leaving haiti to be to go to montreal where i'm from but i'm we're all in los angeles right now it's like what am i going to do knowing that i'm carrying not just my parents and my grandparents but their parents and their grandparents so we have yeah. this whole lineage it's like i need to keep making money yeah the expectations let's talk about that the because high i think expectations. i think many of us carry that mm -hmm. and then you know when we talk specifically about black women or women of color we talk about immigrant right women whose families sacrificed in ways we can't even imagine. I can't I can't imagine what my parents did to to the raise obligation, us. The obligation, the sense of obligation we feel to be pragmatic cuz that's really what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Like and I'm with you. For many, many years, I mean, I wouldn't let go of my consultant gig because I thought about whose shoulders I was standing on. Mm -hmm. And I had a responsibility to be successful, right? You even had the choice Right. Some of parents didn't have the opportunities that are extended to us. Yeah. And then you had like they didn't have the choice yeah. sometimes. And yeah. now here you are doing like your father's work yeah. coming out of it. And then I want to talk a bit more about your book, The Calling. For people, what is a calling and how yeah. does one find it? It is the thing that you just you cannot run from because we all we all have it. It is the thing that we are called to be, and it is in service to the contribution that we are being called to make. So I describe it in the context of Dharma. And a lot of the way that we think about Dharma is we think about Dharma as our sacred path or duty or obligation or our destiny. But what is also in there is the true essence of who we are. Dr. Wayne Dyer calls it your I am essence, right? Mm -hmm. God rest his soul. Your I am essence, your I am-ness. That part of you that transcends any label or accomplishment or thing you've done, it's what you come in with. Mm. Can you give us, like, first, where is Dharma coming from, yeah. the concept of it? So, the dar so in the Hindu lineage in the Sikh lineage it is a term that's used to describe or discuss sort of the path or the way right mm. it's also if you think about it in the context of uh Lao Tzu and 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 sort of the the world of, of East Asia it's known as the Tao right so it's this whole idea of the path or the way in which we are being invited or called to to move in the world or called mm -hmm. to be in the world and for me, when I began to study that term or that concept or that idea, that aspect of your true self, for me, I felt wasn't prominent enough in sort of our mainstream understanding of the, the, the concept. And so what it all begins with is our ability to come into alignment with our true selves. And we hear that term all the time, yeah. right? But for so many of us, we're like, what does that mean? Yeah. And where is it? You know, my joke is like, I'm looking in my hamper. I'm looking in my sock drawer. I'm looking at, you're you not, know. You're not going to find it I can't there. find it, right? You know, so on, like this, your book is called The Calling. So when we talk, we think about calling, we think about something that's spiritual. Yes. And then you just tell, told us that the calling is a purpose, but also it's related to Dharma. It's related to it's yourself. like your life. Your life It's path. your soul. Yeah, it's and, your soul's and, calling. Okay, so it's happening inside. Of yes, you. it's the deepest longing of your soul. Mm. You know, and and the way that we find it, you know, is that it's always about what we feel passionate about. It's always about what we feel drawn to. You know, my joke is that there are 360 degrees of inspiration. If you ever want to know what you care about, don't only look at what inspires you, look at what pisses you off. Mm. <laughs> right? Because... Anytime we touch our anger or our discomfort or our upset, we're bumping up against a value Ooh. and something that we value. And so our work or our opportunity in being able to understand the nature of our calling is to look at those things that most deeply inspire us 
as well as to look at those things that most deeply trouble us. So let's let's give a real example. Let's say if I I'm very like I hate negative people. Mm-hmm. I I just I can't. Yeah. So what does it mean about my values? Yeah, what does it mean about your values? For those of us who really uh have a high sense and I want to speak this because I don't think we talk about this enough, a heightened sensitivity. Mhm to negativity. Yes. Like it me. often means that our context and what we're being called to offer and bring is kindness, compassion, and love, right? That there's something about the nature of kindness, or there's something about the nature of honoring others that feels integral to what we value and believe is important. So if I'm sensitive to negative people, and I feel it a lot, So what you're saying is that I should bring more kindness to the person? Yeah, there's an opportunity, exactly, that your invitation, it's like when we get upset about what's missing, mm-hmm. it's often in the recognition that whatever is missing is ours to bring. Aha, uh-huh. I think I love that because it feels like leadership. 100%. Like if you see problems to solve, you should volunteer, because some people don't see it. Right. You should volunteer Solve your, these problems. It's your, bring, it's, it's, it bothers you because it's the void that you're being invited to fill. Yeah. Now, what I will say about this, right? Because sometimes that call is super mom, I used to say, right? Or love to say, or super mogul. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes it's a combination of both, right? So again, the vehicle, the way, the strategy for how it comes to life. But this idea of recognizing that often what we are most agitated about and that's the key thing because sometimes there are things that are missing in an environment and we're like well that's missing wow that's too bad we're just going to tell our boss that's to go salt. fix it our, you know our boss saying. should go fix it right? right or somebody else should go do it but when we feel agitated about it when we can't sleep or we can't stop talking about it or focusing on it then that's got that's something in there that's got your name on it So then it's yours to go solve. It's, it's your it's- opportunity to start to look at. And and when I find those moments for myself, I, and this is, you know, again, consistent with my own practice, but I ask, okay, what am I, what am I to do here? What am I being asked to do here? Mm-hmm. What am I being called to do? The thing that I will also say is many of us, our instincts, our urges, the things that guide us, like sometimes we'll be sitting on the couch and might be like, you'll feel, call your mother. You have no idea why, but you're being urged to call or you're being urged to go to the door or you're being urged to send an email or to have a conversation or to reach out to someone, mm-hmm. right? I think what, about what is that? the serendipity of you and I meet, yeah. right? This I found, conversation. I found the urge of interviewing you and getting I to know you. I felt the urge to come, right? Yeah. It was just, you know, it was a, a new group, a new environment, a new community. And yeah. I just felt the urge to be there. Yeah. And the minute I met you, I was like, oh, got that. Okay. We were meant why. to meet. You know what I mean? And you all, you will find that synchronicity, that serendipity, that alignment happens more and more and more when we're paying attention, I when we're amazing. following the guidance, when we're listening. And just for our audience who doesn't know where we met, so we met at my house because I hosted a Wonder Woman dinner which is our, this amazing uh, dinners uh, created by Yao Hoang. Yes, shout out Yao and Wonder Women in the Hatchery. <laughs> yeah, so I welcomed everybody. I opened the doors of my patio and then everybody had lunch under the trees with flowers. And that's when I met you and everybody was invited to present themselves wow. and things that was not on our, uh, that Google didn't know about us. And for me, you were so welcoming. You were so loving. You were so open. You all know sometimes we can come to events or gatherings and, and you know, you want to feel that sense of welcome, but that's not always the vibe. No, that's, it's not Just always real the vibe. talk. That's not always the vibe. And <laughs> for me, the vibe was love from the beginning. Like the minute I looked in your face and your eyes and your smile, I was like, oh, this is family. Oh, this is home. Thank you. I just, I just loved it. And I, I want to keep hosting these events. And I'm just so happy that we met. Too. And I'm super excited that I discovered your books and the calling particularly. How do you help people? Yeah. Because you have a technology yeah. in your book. Yeah. How do you help people find their purpose? So this sort of stay true, get paid, do good blueprint is really, you know, um, what my commitment was to the book was mm-hmm. to really create a blueprint. Like if you don't ever talk to me, 
you have a step-by-step-by-step guide for how to get there, right? And so obviously it begins with the stay true, which is so much of what we've been talking about. But it's also hard. Yeah. How do you stay true? Well, like whichever yeah. countries you're coming from. Yeah. It's, it's, how do you... Like, it's about that being willing to question and challenge what we've been told. Mm -hmm. There are things that we've been taught that absolutely enliven and empower us, that shape and inform us and give us what we need to thrive. At the same time, there are things that we have been taught or things that we have experienced that have challenged us, that have challenged us in ways that have limited our ability to be our full selves or limited our ability to be in our full capacities or most importantly, Kathleen, limited, limited our ability to love ourselves mm, self -love. and accept ourselves. That's super important. Because what I'm hearing- from, ourselves. Yeah, what I'm hearing from you is like, we all have limiting beliefs. And when you find your purpose, then you can overcome these limiting beliefs. And I think it's a hand in hand, meaning ideally your calling gives you the incentive. That's how I think about it, so right? It motivates words, you to go after I'm what moving, you want. 100%. If I'm moving towards a vision, I got more motivation, right? So it's kind of like if I think about this even in the context of health and well-being, if I'm thinking about that gorgeous gold lame dress I'm trying to get into, <laughs> I got a lot more incentive to eat that celery. <laughs> Come on, y'all. You look amazing, just, by the way. It's just like the random, you know, yo, eat celery, right? <laughs> and so I just want to say that, that we are motivated and inspired. And this is, this is the nature of our soul. Our soul is born to aspire. That's what our soul does at the very core and the center of our being, our soul aspires in the name of supporting our becoming, our full selves, our, our becoming, becoming our most powerful selves. So becoming your most powerful self, which is in alignment with, or which is your, your calling. Yeah. And which is your purpose in life. Yeah. So now I have so many questions about that. So because you have stayed through Get, get paid, paid and, and do, do good. good. And yes. these three are supposed to work together. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So yeah. the stay true journey, this is the beginning, right? Which is sort of the finding, honoring, and embracing your authentic self and learning how to start to love your authentic self, right? That's the stay true journey. I describe that as moving from victim to vision. Mm. And the idea there, when I say victim, is more about being at the mercy of our circumstances, living by default, living mm -hmm. in reaction to everybody else's expectations or living in reaction to what we think is against us, right? Being oppositional in our, in our purpose in terms of how we move, right? And so when we come out of the place of victim and we move to a place of vision, what we begin to understand is that we are the co-architects of our destiny. You're yes. the creator of your destiny. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's a co-creative journey, meaning the universe, source, however we want to describe it, mm -hmm. divine providence, the energy has a role to play in collaboration with us. But they're taking orders like a waiter at a restaurant from us. Mm -hmm. When we say, I want to achieve this, I want to accomplish this, I want to move from this. What we have to discern in the context of Stay True is, is that aspiration coming from what we think everybody else thinks we should want mm -hmm. or is it truly a longing of our soul but how does do one do know? that how does yes. one because like it's how on paper on paper yes. in your book it sounds amazing i'm going to tell you how you, you know yeah you have you yes. have all the steps it haunts you hmm. it will not turn you loose i remember seeing uh, a beautiful interview with lynn manuel manuel miranda who is the creator of Hamilton. Mm. And he talked about the fact that for seven years, and he just did this. He said, for seven years, this was Hamilton. In my ear, on my shoulder, you need to create it. It needs to come through. It wants to happen. It wants to happen through you. And he kept being distracted, doing other things, creating other things he was teaching at the time. And, you know, finally he surrendered and said, okay, I'm going to do this, you know, and it began with this first kind of monologue rhyme that he did at the social uh, innovation event at the White House when the Obamas were, uh, you know, newly inaugurated into the White House through this big event. And then Miranda took an excerpt of Hamilton. And that was the beginning for him of being able to put that seed out into the water. 
So he listened to his calling. It was a gentle tap on the shoulder. It was not like and a life point. I, I'm sure over the course of seven years, and, and we'll have to ask him one day, <laughs> you and I, but over the course of seven years, I'm sure that tap got stronger and stronger mm. and stronger to a point potentially where he couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat, he couldn't think about anything else. Wow. Now, the thing that I want to say about this is that I believe we all have some semblance of that, but we've become really adept at pushing it down. Mm-hmm. and moving it aside. Because after all, we have to be practical. I can, after I can, all, we have I can to be resonate. pragmatic. After all, we yeah. got mouths to feed, right? We've got We're going to pay the bills. You see what I'm saying, right? So we have all of the justification to explain why we are not listening to what's nudging us. But the most important thing that I want all your listeners to know, and anybody who, who you know has the great fortune to pick up the book, if that's where you're being guided or called, is that whatever assumption we have about what we have to trade to answer is the place where I'm going to work. Because that's the lie. Mm. That's the lie that what you have to sacrifice is so painful, right? That you won't be able to take care of yourself is why the get paid is a section in the book, right? Because the book was really written in response to the three biggest questions I would get Mm -hmm. in terms of what would stand in the way of people answering their purpose or answering the call, right? One was, so who am I? Who do I think I am to deserve this life? Who do I think I am to be this person that I'm being called to be? Who do I think I am to do this podcast or take that stage or write that book or you all know, right? Or take that role in that corporation or lead those people, All the time, this is all the fear and the doubt and the insecurity that often can hold us hostage, right? Second question always is anytime we find something we're passionate about, there's a belief that we have to trade passion for money. It is a big belief. that either you got passion and you loving what you're doing and you're, you know, making a difference in the world or you, or you, and you're starving or you making the big bucks, right? There is a dichotomy. Right? That is, there's and no it's way. It's deeply ingrained in our culture. It's yeah. deeply ingrained in the zeitgeist. It's deeply ingrained in every single one of our belief systems that you have to trade. And that is the second place where I go to work mm-hmm. because I believe, especially given the level of innovation and evolution that is occurring and the speed at which innovation and evolution are occurring in our society right now. I mean, listen, think about it. 10 years ago, did we know what a blogger was? 10 years ago, do we know what? A, 15, okay, because I was, I was blogging, yeah, I was blogging in French. Yeah. 15 years ago, do we even know? But, but like there was never even a roll call yeah. day blogger. And yeah. now you have people who are making massive you contributions. Have creators, you have blogs influencers, and podcasts. Yeah. And you see what I'm saying? And if like, well, we didn't know what an influencer was. Now, we know the work of influencers is older than dust, right? In other words, we've always had people who have been here to inspire us, we've always had people who've been here to guide us. But there's something about the democratization of technology and the way in which it's now allowed people to have the tools to answer their calling and their Mm -hmm. purpose more readily and more easily, which are things that we all should be celebrating. Because the truth of the matter is, I think that so much of what we're in is the age of the citizen. Again, I talk about this in the book. We're in the age of the citizen, which is all about what are you here to do? And how can we support and facilitate you in doing what you're here to do, right? Because that's the way we get the world we want. I think it's super interesting because like a lot of people are afraid of this purpose or their their calling or what they're here to do. You have an exercise that's called the belief exercise, inventory. inventory. The belief inventory. How do you help people via this workshop that seems powerful, which is the belief inventory? Yeah, so when we really want to take a, a visionary stance in the center of our lives, it begins with paying attention to what we believe. Very successful people, right? And I'm talking about true success, whole success, right? I'm not sort of talking about Pyrrhic success, right? Shout and then just money. Nichols, right? yeah. I'm talking about whole success, right? Where you're, you are uh, whole in your mind, your body, your spirit, you have relationships that are healthy, you are doing things that you love, right? The bigger, much bigger function than just the acquisition of the material, yeah. right? Though that may be in there. Because a lot of people are very rich, but very depressed, sad. Not good, happy, yeah. not fulfilled, yeah. right? But I'm talking about true success, which is really happiness, joy, and fulfillment, and a sense of real contentment and peace with who you are and what your life is about, right? That, right? is really 
a, a, a function of alignment. It's a function of alignment. It's a function of really recognizing what your values are, really paying attention to that unique combination of talents and gifts, those things that you bring that really make a difference. Often I say to people, if they don't know, well, what do I bring or what makes me different or what makes me interesting? I say to them, ask the people in your life, like what are the things that people are always coming to you for, yeah. right? And it may not be your job, Right? Maybe it something may not totally be, different. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It may be, but you're in, anytime you're in a job environment, people are coming to you for it. Or in your family or in your community, you are the one whose door people knock on. Those are all clues to what your purpose and your calling are, mm. right? The get paid part of the journey, right? So that's the stay true victim division. But the get paid part really comes into play when you are willing to move from scarcity to abundance. Mm. And so again, we look at what you believe. We have to come back because everything, I started to say, right, successful people pay very close attention to what they believe. And it isn't just like, oh, I believe this. I'm always going to believe this. There are certain things for us that that will be the case. But there are other things where we are constantly updating the file it's kind of like if you think about your operating system mm -hmm. on your computer or your phone, we need to update the file from time to time. You, you refresh your beliefs. Refresh your beliefs. So you do this belief exercise, you inventory. Do this belief inventory. And then you have, in Get Paid, you have multiple steps. One of the steps is forgiving the constraints of your financial past. Yeah. Can you tell us more about what, where people we are stuck? We carry a lot of shame around financial mistakes that we've made. And it's interesting in the sense of sometimes trauma or disappointment or tragedy can impact our finances mm -hmm. because it impacts the way that we view ourselves. And so, the way that we view money as well. And the well. way that we view money as well, 100%. So any place where we have shame, any place where we have guilt, for some of us, that's stood in the way of us getting the knowledge and information we need. In other cases, it's influenced choices we've made to do things or not do things. For some of us, we've made big financial mistakes. So there's a lack of self-trust mm. and a lack of self-belief. Often, in my experience, when I find people who are struggling with money, it's more about what they believe about themselves. Wow. Can you give us an example of like a, a person that you coach or... Yeah. Like a summary, a fake person. Yeah. We don't want to name so, names. So there, there's an example in the book where I talk about an incredible entrepreneur who had built a really successful business. And they were wanting to kind of go to another level of expansion and growth, and they were really being challenged. And what happened was that the business, which had been normally really thriving, was starting to actually go the other way. Mm. And we all reach these points, you all, in our life and in our work where we continue to do the things that – we're winning for us in the beginning, all of a sudden we hit a plateau. And it's, those things that we're yeah. doing are not winning anymore. Yeah. And in this particular case, she came in to work with me. And as we began to explore and talk a little bit more, we discovered that she had hired someone on her team who had become very antagonistic toward her. Ooh, so somebody was toxic, bringing some negativity in the culture. And she was tolerating. Because mm, the culture is what you allow, not what you create on a beautiful slide. She was tolerating and had a lot of justifications for why, right? Because, and, and we experience this as we know in corporations with our corporate leaders a lot as well. You know, uh, shout out Deepa Parshathamam, my sister, uh, and information in our work with Power Redefined. We talk about the toxic rock star, mm -hmm. right? The great performer who puts the sales numbers on the board, but wreaks havoc every place else. Yeah, the person who gossips, bring a lot of negative energy, was always backstabbing and, and chatting. Doesn't yeah. know how to inspire people, doesn't know how to work in collaboration with others, right? Yeah. All those things. And so the challenge there was recognizing that she had a lot of shame and anger and hurt around the experience of working with this person. And, of course, the person she was most angry with was herself, mm. right? Because she had somehow allowed herself to wind up in this situation. And so we began to talk about what would it take to shift the conversation before we got fired the person 
Because if we didn't deal with the core conversation or the core belief, she would just replace that person. Yeah, you replace and then the same cycle and the same behavior comes back. Because there's something on the person that was toxic, but there's also something on the leader or the founder of the company where they can't address this is where the your belief toxic system. behavior. This is where and, your belief system comes in. And then you work with, with this person for on the belief inventory to figure out where is it that you're allowing this and how is it that you can transform it. Yeah. Or how 100%. can you transform it? 100%. And so what she came to understand was that at a young age, she was responsible for her family mm. and keeping the peace and making sure everybody got along and making sure that everything worked well. And she had been playing that role out in her company and that if anybody was not happy or anybody was not sort of aligning, that it was her fault. So she put all the blame on herself. And so it wasn't until she could see that and even understand the origin of that story and where that narrative got created before she could actually access the ability to change it and create a new narrative and create a new story. Yeah, I think that's super important because in your book, I think, thank you for sharing that. In your book, you talk about staying true and we talked about how to stay true, look at your beliefs, and then getting paid and then doing good. I want to go into the getting paid because there's an inauthenticity, and we talked about it earlier because it's a bit of a trifecta, yeah. right? So, like, staying true, getting paid, doing good. How do you get paid while staying true? Mm -hmm. Like, we talked about the constraints of your belief. We talked yeah. about, like, forgiving yourself and your, your financial past. Yeah. But what are the other ways to the, ensure that you get paid? Yeah, you in a sustainable paid. way that's good for you, good for the planet, good for aligns also with, with your purpose. Yeah. So the big thing, again, that we've got to heal is this belief that we have to trade, that it isn't possible for the trade to be our authentic selves and make great money. It isn't possible to do what we love and make great money. And we have a lot of narratives, right, in our mainstream society that tell us that it's not possible. Yeah. So when we come to this conversation of getting paid, one of the questions I ask in the work all the time when I work with leaders is, what is your money truth? Mm. So there's the, like, what you've inherited, and we do deep work around exploring what it is that you've inherited, right? Because all of us have inherited a series of messages and conversations about money is what you said before, right? From like our parents, from money. society, from everywhere. From parents, yeah. from society, from mentors, from institutions that we frequented, right? For some of us, we've got deep spiritual beliefs that have a particular perception about money and the role of money that may be in the way of our ability to experience or feel our full sense of mm -hmm. abundance and prosperity. So we look deeply at what we've inherited, but then we also look at but what feels true. And this is a question that I encourage us you do nothing else in the conversation. Just start to ask yourself that question. What feels true about what feels money? feels true about money? And what feels true about what I want to create when it comes to my money? What feels true about the way I want to earn my money? What feels true about the kind of people that I want to collaborate and work with? Mm -hmm. Or the kind of people that I want to serve? And this is the place where we then start to see our values. Mm -hmm begin to emerge and what we value, right? And so, again, in our traditional sort of belief or conditioning, we're told, well, that doesn't matter. You just got to go get that check. You're going to work with people you hate. You're going to be in toxic environments. You're going to do things you don't want to do You're that gonna go have against your Yeah, it's your okay spirit. to have PTSD. <laughs> you understand? It's okay to have insomnia. Step it's, over all of that. And it I doesn't think, matter as long as you have a lot of money in your bank account. And listen, hopefully you just don't spread it all on the houses and, and cars. And, and this, this leads me literally, Kathleen, to, to, to the second book, which is coming, is that I think we are done stepping over the elephant in the room. I think we are done stepping over those things that at, at some point in our life become undigestible. So some toxic behaviors in that terms we, of the, what we tolerate, right? Yeah. And our threshold of tolerance, right? And so in the work of getting paid, it is really about being willing to challenge those status quo beliefs that tell us that we can't. Now, here's the truth. We have lots of examples of people who have followed their vision 
yeah. who have followed their calling. You have like Deepak Chopra. Incredible contributions, right? Mm-hmm. You Ariana Uffington. Venus and Serena Williams, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we can name, we can look in just about every field of endeavor, right? I, th- I think about Beyonce and, and the power of this Renaissance tour, right? Sh- shout out to those of you who went to the tour, participated in the tour. It's billions of dollars. Deeper in, back. in what was the art and the music was a commitment to family and safety and freedom and self-expression. And when you look at some of the great creators of our world, whether they're in, you know, business or finance or investment or art or technology, they are dreamers at their core. And they're able to make the dream a reality. Because in, in your book, you talk about celebrating new ways of doing business. Yeah. And how does one celebrate those new ways Is- that are not like struggling in a nine to nine or nine to five, however you want to call it, yeah. working with toxic people around you. you how do you break to through? honor what's important? Mm. And sometimes that's, it begins with, with very, very small steps. Speaking up at the coffee cooler, like, okay, you know, that this wasn't this, cool. This, yeah. This is not me. working for me. I'm not going to tolerate this behavior. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes it's asking for support. I need your help. I have a big project or I've just gotten a big role. I think, and this is a big one for us as women of color and a big one specifically for us as black women. Mm -hmm. We deserve to be supported. We deserve to ask for support. Every great visionary leader, contributor to our modern and our ancient society did not do it alone. No, you need like shoulders to rely on. You need advisors, sponsors, mentors. Our ability to start to do business in a new way is our ability to begin to consider what would it look like if more of the values I hold were present. And your company may not be the one to usher those in. You may be the one. Yeah, because in your book, you talked about monetizing with someone else's company, and then you talk about monetizing within your own company, being an entrepreneur versus being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And those are different paths, and people can follow different paths. Yeah. What's your advice for people who need to figure out, should I be an entrepreneur or should I be an an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur. I think for entrepreneurs, often you have a strong vision. Mm -hmm. You can feel it moving through you. There's something very specific that wants life, and it wants you shaping it from the very beginning, mm-hmm. right? It's an idea, it's an innovation, it's a solution, and you can feel it, right? And you, <laughs> you're you a little bossy. Because <laughs> you want your you vision often, to happen. You don't, you don't necessarily want to work for somebody else. You really want to be calling the shots, yeah. right? And so, you know, the other thing I would say with entrepreneurs, and I do, by the way, give 13 criteria in the book, as you know. Yeah. Like that help you sort of identify, are you an entrepreneur? But here's the thing, even bigger than that, Kathleen, which is I believe that all of us need to be thinking entrepreneurially. Yeah, ev- anywhere we are. Right, because. We launch initiatives that are going to drive impact. In we're committed to everywhere. contribution. Mm-hmm. Whether we're in a corporation, whether we're in a small business, whether we're in our own shop, every single one of us should be looking at our relationship to the mission and we should be looking at what's the contribution that we're here to make to the mission. Yeah. Right? And that is across the board. And so when I talk about this idea as a leader, whether you're in an organization or whether you're running your own shop, you have an opportunity to bring your values. It's important. I think a lot of people don't feel permission, especially in larger organizations. Yeah. They're like, well, this seems to be what's accepted. Well, I need to play by the rules. This, yes, Sometimes this you have to be, be the small. leadership that's rewarded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this, and, and I really do want to say to you all, and I know this is a provocative thing to say, we have more room than we think we do. Hmm. So that's extremely, extremely powerful. In, in your book, when you start talking about doing good, you talked about conditioned victimhood. You talk about it's to monetize your true calling. So all that you are and do is in perfect alignment with who you want to be and what you want to see in the world. And in that section of doing good, you also talk about the three L's. 
which I think is, is super imp important and interesting because you, I'm going to read like this portion about sustainability because driving impact is also about how can people drive impact in the world for climate, in AI leadership, in their career. And I'm going to read that um, paragraph. In 2015, more than 190 world leaders gathered at the United Nations and committed to 17 sustainable development goals, the SDGs, to help us all and extreme poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and also fix climate change by the year 2030, which is actually in six years. Yeah. They've wildly published these ambitious goals with the belief that each of us has a role to play if we're going to achieve the vision of a more prosperous, equitable, and sustainable world. And then you go on to say, now take a moment to revisit your articulated purpose from your three L's, right? Which is live, love, and lead. And then you talk about where does your purpose align with these goals? And you talk about the 17 objectives. Can you talk to us a little bit more about live, yeah. love, and lead, your, your framework to, to be able to do good and, and This is the new for formula for success right, that I put forth in the book. This is what I call the true paid good formula for success. And how you live is about your values and what you value. We've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about values today. And every single one of us has a set of values that we're operating from. Mm -hmm. Whether we know it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we understand it or not, we do. And our opportunity is to start to consider when I look at how I'm moving in the world, when I look at the things I'm saying yes to, when I look at the things I'm bringing my energy and my attention to, to what degree are my values in alignment. guiding the way? Come on, mm -hmm. guiding the way, right? So how you live is really getting to the core of the principles and the convictions that actually guide the way you want to operate and show up. Mm -hmm. How you love is about your mission right, which is about your work in the world, which is about your call. What are you here to bring? What are the, you, those unique combinations of talents, gifts, and abilities that you have been given mm -hmm. to share, whether you've acquired them or cultivated them over time or whether you just kind of came in with them, Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. They were just yours to bring to this world. But this opportunity to really look at, am I working in alignment with my unique talents and gifts and abilities. In other words, am I bringing my unique talents and gifts and abilities to bear on whatever environment I'm working inside of? And if not, then that's an that's a and that's not, a call huge, to be able to find your purpose. Huge opportunity yeah. to go. Okay, I'm not in alignment because this is a conversation of alignment. Yeah. I'm not in alignment. No judgment, but just an acknowledgement of what you're what you're noticing and observing. And with move the crowd, you're helping people go from. Con conditioned victimhood to also you talk about in your book about being becoming Visionary a contribution exactly and yeah. being a conscious creator and you talk about you say you are creative and that's a superpower tell us more about being yes. creative as being a superpower creative. yeah so the lead part this is sort of connects to the third aspect of the live love lead the lead part is what you're here to what you are being called i describe it as the passionate impulse that guides you towards the opportunities or challenges you most want to affect in the world. Mm -hmm. So for some of us, it's about bringing brand new innovations. For others of us, it's about solving entrenched issues. Whatever the case may be, often it's a combination of all of the above. But the idea is the passionate impulse, the thing that haunts you, the thing that won't leave you alone, that is yours. And so when we start to work with our conscious co-creative power, it's with the belief that we can make a difference, right? It takes me to this third question, like, so why did I write this sort of good, you know, I said to you, the stay true was in response to who am I, that mm -hmm. big question. The get paid part of the book was in response to how am I going to pay my rent? Literally, I give you a blueprint there. <laughs> the do good part was the question really at the heart of that was, can I really matter? And I think a lot of people are asking that question. Do I have impact? Do I Can matter? I really, yeah. And it's what we want more than anything. So contribution is a need. Hmm. I want to say that again. Think about it. No matter whose presence you're in, what do people aspire and seek for most? An opportunity to be seen, an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to make a difference. Most people thrive and strive for making 
a difference in the lives of other people. They want to see, even if it's just redesigning a room, you want to be able to know that when I walked into that room, it looked mm-hmm. one way. And when I walked out of that room, it looked another way, right? So people, so you're saying human beings are wired to want to make a difference and to, to be able to have impact yes. in the world. And the doing good, you also talk about like doing good for our planet, creating a more sustainable way of living, working, playing, and conducting business. 100%. And your co-creative power is what drives that. So in other words, when we're willing to embrace the fact that we are creative, because we're creating all the time, mm-hmm. right? Think about y'all, we speak things into existence, whether we want them or not. Oh man, here comes that person going to give me a parking ticket. Sure enough, here come the cop next to your car, <laughs> right? And we don't realize that when we speak things with conviction, when we speak things with emotion, when we speak things with certainty, mm-hmm that there's an energetic vibration, right? This is where we talk about the law of vibration. Yeah. There is an what energetic is the law vibration. vibration. And it's different from the law of attraction or is it's it? It's the same. It's the same. It's okay. the same, right? We're speaking about the same thing. What we're really talking about is frequency. Mm-hmm. All of us, you know, this is a science lesson, right? All of us are particles. We are vibrating energetic fields of matter. <laughs> yeah, Joe Dispenza, <laughs> yeah. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about it. God bless Joe. Yes, God bless The vibration, Joe Dispenza, energy. Right? Oprah talks about it as well. Yes, and we call it, you know, listen, we also have slang for it. It's your vibe. Oh, yeah. You know, we'd be like, I, I don't like her vibe. I don't like her vibe. Right? That's the energy. That's the frequency that you're emitting. So we all emit, but so do the other things around us. We are in a field, a magnetizing or repelling field. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is when you pay attention to your energy, which is really your belief system, right? Like expressing itself. I'm going to say that again. It's your belief system expressing yourself. When you pay attention to your energy, what happens is that the vibration begins to rise. To elevate. Do you believe that there's people with high vibration and people with low vibration? I believe that we have access to the full spectrum. And I think some of us hang out in low vibe. Mm -hmm. And I think some of us hang out in high vibe. And then I think a lot of us vacillate between. Yeah. Within (laughs) the day, within minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Depending upon what's going on, the vibe can be funky. Right? Yeah. But what's important, especially when we think about doing good and making our difference in the world, is that when we allow the creative energy that is ours to move through us, when we bring our full intention to our passion and to our commitments there's a way in which that magic begins to show up in our day-to-day world, right? So within, so without. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing our work, because this is also why I say the alignment with your work is important because you have, there's a difference between good work and your work, work that has your name on it. When you align with the work that has your name on it, your purpose is fire. And it's, it has and it can drive a lot of impact. And for our listeners, our listeners are hoping to become change makers or they're already change makers, but they want to drive more impact. What are your top three tips for people who want to drive impact in their career? One, start to pay attention to where the fire is for you. Mm. Where are you passionate? El fuego. And, yes, el fuego, right? And that's like, where are you inspired? Where are you excited, right? And there are things that you're naturally drawn to. And sometimes you have no idea why you're drawn to them, but you just are. Start to trust that more. Start to believe in that more. Also, notice where you're pissed off. Yeah. What notice where you're you upset. Are. Yeah. Notice where you're really ready to take it to the streets, literally and metaphorically, right? <laughs> Begin to observe. And what is the issue or what is the challenge associated with that? Also, notice When you're engaging with people, where are you falling in love, Mm. right? For some of us, we're called to work with the little ones. Yeah. For others of us, we're called to work with women. For others of us, we're called to work with men. Whatever the the call is, the nature of your call is in terms of who you're here to serve, start to pay attention to that. And then just begin to ask yourself, and you can do this, you all, on a micro scale. I'm going into this meeting right now at 9 o'clock. What's the difference I want to make? Yeah. What is your purpose for this call? Boom. What's the outcome and the difference with the impact that you want to drive? This is amazing. Minute those by are, minute. Those are amazing tips. Thank you so much. And for people specifically who want to drive impact in the climate, in the world, in racial equity, what are your what would be your top three tips? Because you've been Done able it. to be an activist as well. The UN Sustainable Goals provide an incredible framework 
to help us get clear about where the areas of impact reside. Mm. So I, you know, it's in the book, you all. I give you the the graphic. I give you the rundown. I also give you the different social impact strategies, the way some of us work on culture and shifting paradigm. Other of us feel called to shifting policy. Other of us feel called to frontline organizing. So you'll be able to discern what it is for you. But literally, you'll have a step-by-step blueprint to develop your own do-good strategy. But it starts with your passion. Mm -hmm. What's the change? What's the transformation? Who do you most want to serve? What are the talents and gifts that you really want to express and share and bring in service to that issue, in service to that community, that population? And then allowing that to start to take shape and form. The other thing that I want to say is it doesn't look any one way. I think traditionally we've had sort of an opinion about what activism yeah. looks like. Yeah, Because some people see it as like we have to march in the street. We have to, to like chain ourselves to some buildings and or parade half naked. Right. And to, there are people. For women's rights, for, for climate action, for, for different reasons. There are people who never would embrace those titles. They do not see themselves those ways, but they are absolutely transforming their communities. I mean, I want you to think about like the grandmother, the auntie yeah. that gets the whole neighborhood aligned around the community watch or gets mm-hmm. the whole neighborhood aligned around the community cleanup, right? Yeah. Every day, ordinary people making extraordinary commitments in the name of love to themselves and one another. So you have the power to drive impact and it's super Im- impressive. I want to hear more from you. What is next from you? Because you wrote... um a calling. You yes. also have a new book, which is a coaching program around money. Yes, making and money making change. In 2020, during the pandemic, you created Information, yes. which was for mo- women of color. Yes. So what's next? So I am working on the second book, mm. which is all about the reset on ambition Ooh. and the way in which I believe this new definition on ambition and success is emerging, specifically post the Great Resignation. Okay. So that book is coming. Shout out Wiley. That book is coming soon. Uh, my publishers. Um, and also building on the work of information, which worked with women of color leaders from all walks of lives. Uh, the work of that sort of community um, is now been uh, elevated in the sense of the next step of that work is born to shine. And what it is born is to a shine? High level mastermind community for women of color leaders and entrepreneurs mm. who are committed to this next era of urgent of courage, agency, authenticity, and contribution. So we've got innovations and ideas, and often we sit on them. Yeah. But we're in an era right now, more than ever, where our leadership, our ideas, or our innovations are needed in the world. And so the Born to Shine community gathers in various configurations and constellations, but mostly we do retreats, quarterly retreats. Mm -hmm. We go all over the world. And the intention is to create spaces where those ideas can be nurtured. It's amazing. So we're looking forward to your next book, which is Reset. It is. Well, the, so we don't know the name the or title, we... I, I, the working title. Um, I, I, I actually won't say, but I will say that it, that the core of it is about ambition. Okay. The core of it is about the way in which we want to reimagine our relationship to work mm-hmm. in service to our highest contribution and in service to our most authentic self. That's amazing. So Born to Shine is coming. There's also a book that's coming. In 2011, you started uh, Move the Crowd where you coached most like hundreds plus people who ended up being New York Times bestseller. Um, Tell us more about the people that you've coached because some people are very famous and we'll have it on the website in your bio. And and so are you still coaching people one on one? So we serve thousands and thousands of leaders every year with the different constellation and configurations of our programs. Um, Some of the the luminary leaders that you're talking about, we've had the privilege to work with people in various aspects of life and sectors of contribution. You know, people like Gabrielle Bernstein and the Spirit Junkie Movement, Reshma Sujani, founder of Girls Who Code and Moms First, um, Amara Jones, who just this past year uh, made the list for Time Magazine's 100 wow, Most Influential. Wow, congratulations. Three shout out Amara, founder of the Translash movement and the Translash media movement. Um, 
and many Those other are incredible, big names. incredible people wow. like that. And, and you know, I, I, what I will say is whether those leaders are really well-known or not as well-known, what they all share in common is that they are living their lives. They are walking their paths. They are responding to their purpose and calling, and they're doing it in a way that is true, that is paid as good. They are whole people experiencing whole success. And that's really, for us, the biggest Con, you know, sort of contribution, contribution yeah. to the work is to be able to put more incredible people in the world who can really have that alignment yeah. and express that alignment. So are you saying that anybody can find their anybody. calling? Anyone? Do you think anybody. everybody has a calling? I do. Okay. Super mom, super mogul. Yeah. I do. Do you think it's going to take, how long does it take to, for someone to find their calling? Yeah, I think for some of us it comes at birth. We know, right? I think about an interview, a beautiful interview with Lady Gaga, where she talked about, you know, before she could even almost walk at two and three, she was sort of reaching up to the piano and putting her finger on the keys. Like she was attracted she knew to the piano, yeah. That it was what it, what it was for her. Other people, they can be 75 and find it. You know what I mean? If I think about one of the oldest bodybuilders, I cannot remember her name. I just saw a beautiful spread of her in a wellness magazine. She's like 81. She started working out at like 68 or wow. something. Right? Wow. Right. And so it's like, and now she's like one of the top wellness wow. fitness experts. You, you can know. start working out now. It's never too late. And that's the thing I really want all of us to know. And at the same time, now is the time. And like now, now in your book, yeah, in your book, you talk about like this collective trauma. Are you saying that now is a time because we're coming from the pandemic? 2020 was hard. It was all the racial equity challenges, the death of, of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all those murders. And we have undergone an awakening. Yeah. And then COVID just forced us at home to figure ourselves out. Yeah. We have all we are not the same people we were three years ago. So, you, I mean, yeah, and that's the case in a normal cycle but given what we've gone through has been unprecedented yeah that and was the word <laughs> you know what i mean mm -hmm. and we are not the same and every single one of us and this is okay so now i'm going to give the title because it just feels like it's there yeah. the great renegotiation we are in the midst of a great renegotiation this is the, the, the title of the second book this is the work that's coming but i believe that every single one of us is really starting to ask ourselves what are we really here for and what are we no longer willing to tolerate? So we're defining our non-negotiables and we're taking actions towards it because we're, we're coming out of a massive collective trauma and we're not willing And we got new negotiate. terms and conditions. Yeah. Sign here. We got new terms and conditions under which we are willing to play. And Bang. we <laughs> owe it to ourselves to find out what those terms and conditions are we owe it to ourselves even more to begin to honor those terms and conditions, whether we're doing it in little ways or big ways. Like I said, it can begin at the water cooler. I know? love it. I love it. It's like the fine prints at the bottom of the ad are going to be blown up and it's going to be on the screen. And it's 100%. We're, we're and not negotiating. Going to be <laughs> no, it's going to be out in the world, just like COVID brought yeah. up all the dirt. And we're going to come to the table in our full power. And we're going to invite those who are negotiating with us to come in their full power. And I think one of the biggest things, one of the questions somebody recently asked me in connection to this new book, they said, what do you think is going to be the future of work? I said, if, if I have anything to do with it, it is going to be the transformation of the us and them paradigm. Ooh. And who's us, who's them? Us right? as a worker? Us as the them. worker, them as the leader of the corporations, the, like, we, and we don't talk enough about it, Kathleen, right? Because it's not, you know, this is provocative to we, say. People say it's Gen right? Z's redefining the way it's, that we it's, But we, live we're going to have work. the opportunity to dissolve the, the construct of the man. And we are now going to become partners in starting to look at what needs to happen with our institutions and our vehicles to really architect the new world, wow. right? And that's, that's what I think wants to be born. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's any mistake that we are seeing the entrenchment of violence in, in various corners of the world that we're starting to see right now. Because I sort of feel like in, in many ways, as horrific as it is, it is starting to lay the ground for something different. Right? So there's because a big when shake do we up. Go, yeah. When do we go? Enough is enough. Yeah. And the lid just blows off and 
and the steam cools off. So thank you so much, Ra Goddess. We were with Ra Goddess at Driving Impact. I feel like it was, it's been a privilege to engage. We've been privileged to read your book. I'm so inspired. I'm excited about the second book. So when is it coming? Uh, it will be the spring of 2025. Okay, the yeah, great renegotiation. We're super excited. Thank you so much. And we'll have all the details about where to find you on in your bio on our website. And I'm, I'm, I just feel very privileged and honored to have spent this hour with you. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much for your amazing work and all that you do. And clearly this is your calling and I'm so privileged to have been a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. It's so funny because like I've been thinking for like 15 years, I need to launch a YouTube channel. I need to launch a podcast didn't do it and I just decided to jump so I'm excited yes thank you Ra <laughs> have a good one thank bye you. bye Driving Impact Collective <laughs>